Well, good morning. Good morning. Hope you, uh, you guys are doing well this morning. We're going to continue our, our journey uh, today of thinking about what it means to be a follower of Christ and, and what it takes to follow Christ. And you know, We left off yesterday thinking about that question. Is there anything that I need to leave right, in order to fully follow Christ? And I hope and pray that you are thinking about that and will continue to pray over that. Maybe God has already shown you something. But if not, continue to, to think about that. Today we're going we're gonna to deal with an issue that, 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 that impacts many of us. And if it does not or has not impacted you personally, I can almost guarantee that, that someone you know, love, or care about deals with that. And the, the, the issue that we're going to talk about today is skepticism. All right. Now, when it comes to skepticism, how many of you would say... By nature, I'm a bit of a skeptical person, all right? All right, some of you, right? That, that's me, all right? I am a Gen Xer, all right? You may have never heard of us because we are the forgotten generation, and we're okay with that, right? We expected that, right? Because we're skeptical. Are you with me? All right, so there was boomers, and then there was Gen X, and then millennials. But all you ever hear about is boomers and millennials, and now, of course, you guys are Gen Z, right? But... But, but we were a generation that was known for being a bit skeptical. And, you know, the, in the world that we live in today, it's not actually that bad to be a little bit skeptical, is it? Because we live in a world that's filled with information, right? You have access to information in this generation like never before, right? We can pull out our phones, go on our tablets, computers, whatever, and we can access more information than we could ever even process in a lifetime. And so, as we filter through that, we have to decipher what is true and what is not true. And there are three, I think, common causes of skepticism I, I, that, that I, I have discovered in my life. And here's number one. If something sounds too good to be true, and if I told you that we were going to operate on a two-hour delay tomorrow at Chehi, anybody think that sounds good? Yes. But how many of you would be skeptical when I told you that? Yes, right? Anyone that's been here around here long enough knows that's not going to happen, right? As, as tempting as it sounds. So if we hear something that just sounds too good to be true, our minds immediately think, hmm, I don't know about that. Secondly, if something doesn't sound quite right, has anyone ever told you something and you're listening to it and you're like, that just doesn't sound quite right. I don't what? Believe you. I don't believe you. And number three, something that doesn't fit with our beliefs or expectations. Right? If I hear something that goes against a strongly held belief or an expectation that I have, my tendency, your tendency, would be not to believe it. Now, again, skepticism when it comes to filtering through the information that we all have to process is actually not a terrible thing. But sometimes our skepticism falls over into our faith. And maybe you have dealt with skepticism about faith, or maybe you've dealt with doubts about God, about salvation, about all those things. And I want you to know if that's you today, you are not alone. Right? You are not alone because there are people in this room that have walked through and dealt with that. One of them is speaking to you. So this is personal for me. And today we're going to encounter Jesus' call on yet more of His disciples. And we're going to see the issue of doubt and skepticism come up. And we're going to see how Jesus interacts with those who have doubts and those who are skeptics. And we're going to see what God offers us. And then I'm going to give you a few practical things that I believe will help you if you're dealing with skepticism or doubts when it comes to faith. And so if you have your Bible, I hope you do, John chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 43 through 51. And again, if, if you are dealing with this or you know someone who has questions or doubts about faith, uh, then I want you to lean into this message and discover and hear Jesus' call for you to follow Him and for them to follow Him. So let's begin uh, by looking at verses 43 and 44. It says, The next day He decided to leave for Galilee. And Jesus found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Now, when we see it says the next day, this is the day after Jesus has spent time with Andrew and Peter. 
And Andrew has already professed his belief, his, his, his deep conviction that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the awaited one, the one that God has promised, that what God had promised to do for his people to send his rescue and his deliverer, Andrew had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And now Philip also hears Jesus' call to be a follower, to be a disciple, to follow him. And, and Philip also believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And so, you know, when you discover something that, that you and your people have long awaited for, right, there, there's, you're excited about it, right? And when something amazing happens, what do you want to do next? Help me out here. Celebrate. Celebrate, yes. And what else do you want to do? Tell somebody, right? When something amazing happens, you got to tell somebody. You have to text somebody or snap them or whatever you guys do these days, right? Uh, in, all, in all the ways that you guys communicate, I don't, I, you know, you have to tell somebody. You wouldn't actually call someone on the phone, would you, right? Do you guys do that? Yeah. All right, very good. I know some in your generation don't really use the phone feature anymore, but... You know, whatever ways that we communicate, when something amazing happens or we discover something, we want to tell someone. And so Philip wants to tell his friend Nathaniel. So notice verse 45. It says, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now let's just pause there. I mean, and, I, and I, I'm going to once again ask you to use your imaginations with me, all right? And so just imagine for a moment that you're Nathaniel, right? You're Nathaniel. You are a faithful Jew. You have a belief in God. And you have expectations about God and even about what he's going to do. And your friend Philip comes and he is way, way, way too excited, right? And you're not a person that is normally way too excited, and so he's very, very excited, and he's talking fast, and he said, man, we have found him, we found the one, right? The one that Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, we found Jesus, the son of Joseph, he's the Messiah. And maybe Nathaniel for a moment was like, really? And then, and then Philip says this, from Nazareth, right? And for, for Nathaniel, he was, his friend Philip lost him at Nazareth. Because Nazareth, in this day, even, even now in modern times, is not a town or a city that anyone wants to be from if you're Jewish. Right? It is looked down upon. I went to Israel a few years ago, several years ago, if I'm going to be honest. And we were going by Nazareth. We had a Jewish tour guide. And we stopped on the hillside and looked down at the town. And he said, that's Nazareth. There's nothing good there. We're going to keep going. Right? And we didn't go into Nazareth. And so no one, no Jewish person expected a Messiah from Nazareth. That was ridiculous. Like if you're from this area, it might be like saying that, you know, I, I, I found the Messiah and he's in Camden. Are you with me? All right. If you're not from the Philadelphia area, you may not get that. But for you that are in the Philadelphia area, you, you get that. And so Nathaniel says this. Look at verse 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And it was a rhetorical question, but it was a question that reflected his heart and his belief that no, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. And Nathaniel is skeptical about what he's hearing. He's skeptical about his, what he's hearing because it sounds too good to be true. He's skeptical about what he's hearing because it just doesn't sound quite right. He's skeptical because it doesn't match up with his beliefs and his expectations. And so he's skeptical. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Right? He's saying to Philip, come on, man. Really? Are you serious? Right? You, this, this is not, no, no, absolutely not. And notice Philip's response. Philip doesn't argue with him. Philip doesn't try to give him a list of rational arguments about why this is true. He just says this, come and see. Come and see. Philip isn't put off by his friend's skepticism. He isn't mad. He doesn't argue. He just says, come and see. And I imagine, right, because I like to use my imagination, that it took a little bit of convincing, maybe a little back and forth. But Nathaniel says, all right, 
fine, right? You know, have you ever done something just to, just to appease a friend, right? Fine, right, fine. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm skeptical, I'm gonna stay skeptical, but I'll come. And then notice what happens. Look in verse 47. And we're going to get to see how does Jesus interact with a skeptic. It says that Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him. And he said about him, Here is a true Israelite. No deceit is in him. So how does Jesus interact with Nathanael? Right? How does he interact with a skeptic? Notice that there is no harshness. There's no anger. But instead he actually gives him a compliment. A wonderful compliment. He says that this is a genuine person, and the language he uses to describe him is basically the language of saying that Nathaniel's the kind of guy that doesn't wear a mask. Right? He's not two-faced. Right? With Nathaniel, you get what you see. Right? Nathaniel's a genuine person. There's no deceit in him. The, this Greek word there for deceit was actually used in culture for fishing bait. All right? So, you know, when you're fishing. Right? and you're using a, a lure or an artificial bait, you're trying to deceive or trick a fish into eating something that isn't real. And so Jesus says of Nathaniel, this is an honest man, there's no deceit in him, he's a straightforward person. And in really, he, he, is, he is pronouncing upon him what was an ideal for, for an Israelite. Look, listen to Psalm 32, verse 2. It says, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit there's no deceit. And so, Nathaniel is a straightforward person. right? He, he is a matter of fact. There's no deceit. But seeing is believing. And when Nathaniel hears about this Messiah from Nazareth, he's skeptical. And as he encounters Jesus here, he's still skeptical. He's still skeptical. And so, as he wrestles through this, notice verse 48. Back in John chapter, he says, How do you know me? Right, when, when Jesus makes this pronouncement about him, his skepticism is still up front, isn't it? How do you know me? Right, I never met you before. Right, how do you know me? He's skeptical. And then notice what Jesus says. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Perhaps Nathaniel was recently sitting under a fig tree meditating on scriptures. We know from historians that under the fig tree was actually an expression uh, in this time of somebody who was sitting and studying the scriptures. And so Jesus uses his supernatural knowledge. He's fully God, yet fully man. And he tells he tells Nathaniel something that he was doing that he could not have known naturally. And notice Nathaniel's response, verse 49. He said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And so when this moment happens, when Nathaniel is now confronted with the supernatural reality that this man who's speaking to him knows something that he could not know humanly, he realizes that what Philip was telling him, the buzz that he had been hearing, maybe even from others, it was true. And Nathaniel, although skeptical, when confronted with this reality, leaves his skepticism. And he makes an amazing pronouncement because he, he pronounces two incredible things. Right? When he says, Son of God, right? he's, he's referring to Jesus' unique identity. Right? That he has a unique relationship with God. Right? And we know that Jesus was the eternal Son of God, come in human flesh. And then he says also, you're the King of Israel. That's a messianic title. And so he recognizes both Jesus' identity and his, his role as Messiah. And so this is an incredible moment for Nathaniel. Because Nathaniel was a skeptic. Nathaniel was not somebody who was easily convinced. Nathaniel was no pushover. But when... Can, when, when he had a supernatural encounter with Jesus, where Jesus revealed his power to him, he moved from skepticism to trust and to belief. And notice Jesus' response. Jesus responded to him and he said, Do you believe only because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. 
And I don't think that Jesus said that in any sort of harsh way. I think Jesus said that probably with a smile on his face, a smile of, of joy. He said to Nathaniel, do you believe because I told you you were sitting under the fig tree? Nathaniel, you have no idea what the next few years will unfold for you and what you will get to see and what you will get to experience as Nathaniel gets to be an eyewitness along with the others of Jesus' life, his ministry, his miracles, his teaching, and ultimately his death and resurrection. Notice verse 51. He said, he said I assure you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, Jesus' announcement of the angels of God ascending and descending, obviously for any Jewish person, would have hearkened them back to Genesis 28, right, where, where Jacob saw a ladder. Remember Jacob's ladder, right? And, and this, this, this connection between heaven and earth that, that Jacob sees. And here Jesus is saying that he is the ladder, that he's the link between heaven and earth, right? And so in, in sharing this, he's, he's connecting his role as the Messiah, but he's proclaiming ultimately what he is going to do. And it ultimately is going to be at the cross, right? And through the cross and the resurrection that Nathaniel will get to see so vividly and so clearly how Jesus will be the link between heaven and earth. Right, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right, Christianity, as we, we talked about this last week, it is absolutely exclusive. Right, the Bible is very clear. There's only one way for humanity to be made right in God's eyes, to be restored to the relationship that you were created for. You were created for a relationship with God. You were made in God's image as a human. And you have a unique capacity to have a relationship with your Creator that is different than every other part of creation. And sin, sin separates us from that relationship. The wages of sin is death. And the Bible says all have sinned and all have died. But Jesus took your sin and my sin in His own body. And He bore the curse and the consequence of your sin. But He did not stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. And He conquered sin and He conquered death and He makes available to anyone and everyone forgiveness of sin and eternal life through faith in Him alone. And so Jesus is revealing Himself to this skeptic. And He, and he reveals Himself and He says, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Son of Man was one of Jesus' favorite titles for Himself. It was a, it was a title that that comes right from the book of Daniel. It pointed to his identity. But it was also a, a title that was, was free of some of the baggage that was going around in Jesus' day because the, the Jewish people were looking for a military Messiah, right? Someone who would, who would solve their greatest problem, which was the occupation of Rome, right? They wanted Rome overthrown. They wanted a king to sit on David's throne. That was the promise. And Jesus one day will sit on David's throne and he will rule and reign over all. And he's ruling and reigning right now in heaven, but he's coming again one day. But before that was going to happen, and the, the people of this day didn't fully understand that there was a greater mission, that Jesus would become king, not by power of overthrowing Rome, but actually dying on a cross. And that's where he would defeat the powers of evil. And that's where he would make salvation possible. And that's ultimately where he would be enthroned. And so he uses this title, Son of Man, that, that moved away from some of those political things to, to reveal his true identity. So as we think about Nathaniel's journey, right? And, and say, okay, so what does this have to do with me? And what does this have to do with my skepticism or my doubts or my questions or the questions that my friends have? or the people in my school, or someone in my family. Right? We, we, we live in a world where, where deconstructing your faith right, is very popular. It's almost expected or cool. And listen, it's good to ask questions. God can handle your questions. It, it, it's good to wrestle through and think through, why do I believe what I believe? Is what I believe real? Is what I believe true? It is good to ask those questions. And you're at a stage in life where by natural development, you are asking those questions. 
And that is good. And so as you wrestle through those questions of faith, and if you deal with, maybe you say, man, I, sometimes I just deal with doubts, and I don't want to deal with doubts, and I don't even want to be skeptical, but sometimes I just feel overwhelmed by that. What do I do? And I want to invite you to do what Philip invited Nathaniel to do, which is simply to come and to see. To come and see. Now, we don't get to have Jesus physically on the earth. So how do we do this? I want to give you five things this morning. Right, five, five things to, to say, how do we do, how do we come and see? Number one, if you are dealing with skepticism, come to a church and sit under the teaching of God's Word. Right? I want to invite you to say, yes, I have some skepticism, or I have some doubts, but you know what? I'm not going to run away. I'm going to come to a church. Maybe you have a good home church now. I hope that you do, that teaches and preaches God's Word. But if you don't, to say, find one. And listen, I know there's some baggage with church, right? I've been through church hurt and church difficulty. Church isn't always a perfect place. But my prayer, my heart for you is that you would find a place that is. And that not only would you come and sit under the teaching of God's Word, because God's Word is true and it's powerful. And it has the power to, to break through our skepticism and to break through our doubts. Because God's Word isn't just words on a paper. It is the living Word of God and it's powerful. God's Word is powerful. I've experienced that power in my own life and in so, watched it in so many others. But not only will you experience that, but you get to experience the fellowship and the encouragement of other people. You know, when we're, in our, it, when we're dealing with doubts and skepticisms, it can be an extremely lonely feeling. And sometimes we feel like, I must be the only person that's ever felt this way. And, and I, I must be terrible at faith or God's mad at me. No, Listen, Jesus is not angry or put off with your doubts and your questions. He invites you to come and see. So come to a church. Sit under the teaching of God's Word. Number two. Oh, before we get there, I just want you to think about the example of Andrew. Right? Andrew came to Jesus because of the preaching of John the Baptist. Right? How did Andrew come to faith? Through the preaching of God's Word. So we sit under the God's Word. Number two. Come to the Bible and search for truth. Right? Peter came to Jesus because of the witness of his brother. Right? Andrew heard John preach and came to faith. Right? And then Andrew went to his brother. And so when we come to the Bible, we get to read eyewitness accounts. Right? The Bible is not just one book, it's many books right, that are compiled together, we believe, under the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. But we get to read eyewitnesses, people who were really there, who really saw, who really experienced. And so when you read the gospel accounts, right, you get eyewitnesses. Or in Luke's case, someone who was not an eyewitness, but who interviewed many eyewitnesses so that he could have a clear picture of the life of Jesus. And he said in his own mind to set an orderly account of the things that happened. Right? For John, he would say, these are the things that I saw. These are the things I experienced. And I write to you about them. And so if you're dealing with skepticism and you're dealing with doubts, go to God's Word. Even you say, man, I'm struck. Just go to God's Word and allow the witness of Scripture to speak to you. God's Word is powerful. Number three, come to prayer and to seek God. Andrew came to Jesus because of the preaching of John. Peter came because of the witness of his brother. Philip came to Jesus as a, from a direct call. Right? And prayer is not only us talking to God, but it's also listening to God. And so I want to invite you to come to prayer and to seek God. If you have doubts, if you have questions, if you're dealing with skepticism, bring them to God. He can handle your doubts. He can handle your questions. He's not angry, mad, or put off. He says, come. Come and see. And so come to God in prayer and seek Him. God speaks to us. Right? He speaks through His Word, but He also speaks through the Holy Spirit. Right? And the Holy Spirit is real. And He lives in and dwells among us. And so God speaks. And so come to prayer and see God. Number four, come to the cross and see Jesus. You know, for me, when I wrestle... Listen, there's, there's, there's all kinds of why questions in life that I don't know the answers to. Right? As a pastor, I, I often encounter people... Uh, not only I get to encounter people in some of the most joyous moments of their life... You get to do weddings and baptisms and baby dedications and all those things. You get to celebrate graduations and sports games. And, but then I also have the privilege 
of walking through situations that are difficult, the unexpected loss of a loved one, right? A diagnosis of a terminal disease, uh, of, of family problems, of a, of a spouse that was unfaithful, all kinds of things. And they're not easy to deal with. And there are a lot of why questions. God, why? God, why are you allowing this? God, why now? Why didn't you answer this prayer? God, why didn't you do what I expected? I, I, I really thought you were going to do this. Or I know you are able. I, I know you have all the power. I don't understand. Listen, there are a lot of why questions in life. And here's the thing. God will not give us the answer to every why question. God will not give us the answer to every why question. And sometimes... It's because we're not ready or not able or could not understand. Sometimes it's because we just don't need to know. Right? Sometimes it's because God has a purpose that we do not understand. But here's the thing that God always offers you in your why questions. And here's what I've learned that I have to do. Is that when I have why questions and I don't understand, I can always go to the cross. And at the cross, I see a God who loved me when I did not deserve it. I see a God who gave His Son for me. I see a Son who willingly gave Himself for me. And He took on my sin and my shame. And He died in my place. And when I come to the cross, I say, I don't know the answer to every why question. But I know that God loves me. I know He loves me because He gave Himself for me. When I least deserved it. And so when I come to the cross and see Jesus, right, I have a personal encounter with His love for me and His grace for me. Nathaniel came to Jesus as he overcame his skepticism and his prejudices. He, he had real prejudices about people from Nazareth. But he overcame them by a personal encounter with Christ. And when you personally encounter Jesus at the cross where He died for you, He's not there now. Right? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. But we come to the cross, when I talk about that, I mean we come and we remember that He was there. That He really did die. It will help you. It will help me. It will not give you the answer to every question. But it will give you the answer to the question that you need. Does God love me? Yes. Did He die for me? Yes. Has He forgiven me? Yes. Do I belong to Him? Yes. Is He with me? Yes. Will I be with Him forever? Yes. And sometimes that's the only answers that God will give you because that's the only answers you ultimately need. And I don't mean that it's easy. But it's good. Number five. Come to the empty tomb and be set free from your skepticism. You know, after Jesus died, even though He told His disciples, I'm going to die, the Messiah is going to die and rise again on the third day. They didn't understand. They could not imagine a dead Messiah. They had no mental grid for that. They couldn't, they couldn't conceive it. And so when Jesus died, they were distraught. They were discouraged. They were disillusioned. They thought all their hopes were gone. They thought it was all over. Right? They, 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 were, they were at the lowest point that they could possibly believe because they had thought and believed and trusted that Jesus was the Messiah. They gave up their lives to follow Him and now He was dead and they thought it was all over. But then on the third day, Jesus appears first to Mary Magdalene at the tomb and then to the others and they realize that He's alive. And for the disciples, for the followers of Jesus, that changed everything. They went from being fearful and hiding out in a room to being filled with the Holy Spirit who came upon them who they encountered the risen Christ, and they went from, from being disillusioned to being faith-filled followers, who all but John will be executed for their faith and their belief in the risen Christ. They will spread the message of the gospel all around their known world. And it was the resurrection that changed everything for them. And when we come, and listen, there are real evidences that point to an empty tomb. And again, we have questions and we have doubts. And then we don't understand. I don't understand everything about the Bible. I don't understand everything about faith. But I know this. The tomb of Jesus is empty. He rose from the dead. That is enough. And I'm not saying that we don't pursue theology and we don't study God's Word. Absolutely. We need to go deep into God's Word and deep into the truth. But we'll never go deeper than an empty tomb. And the empty tomb is the thing that says, is all of this true? Absolutely it is. Listen, skepticism and doubts, they can creep into our life. 
And maybe it's you're, you're, you have never come to faith in Christ and skepticism and doubt is in the way. I'd invite you to do these things. Maybe you're a follower of Christ but you say, man, I, I read this and I watched this and I saw this YouTube video and my friend said this and my teacher said that and I've got all, man, I'm just overwhelmed with doubts and skepticism. Listen, I understand. I understand. But I invite you to do these five things. And skepticism and doubt is painful. Because usually we don't want to doubt. We don't want to be skeptical. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus is not offended by your skepticism. He's not offended by your doubts. He's not mad at you. And he invites you to come and see. And so I want to invite you to come and see. And if you're here and you're dealing with this, talk to me. I would love to talk to you about this. Or talk to your counselor or your, or your faculty. We would love. Don't, don't walk through this alone. Hey, don't walk through this alone. Let someone walk with you. So let's pray together before we head out on our day. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son. I thank you that Jesus loved me and he loved everyone in this room. I thank you that, that your love for us led you to a cross. And Father, I thank you that Jesus died. I thank you that he rose from the dead. Father, we struggle with doubts and skepticism. We struggle with questions. We, we struggle to process all the information that surrounds us and even information about faith. And so, Father, I, I just pray for the one that, that today is really wrestling, doubting, struggling. And, Father, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to them. I pray that you would reveal your love for them, the truth of who you are. And, Father, I pray that in revealing that, you would bring them to a deeper place of faith and trust in you and confidence in your call on their life. And I ask this in Jesus' name.